to end. Whereas the self-confident person will survive to love another day once their narcissism is restored. This means that falling in love can impoverish the self to such a degree that we feel decimated. In some cases, the lover's self-esteem is restored by having his or her love reciprocated. But in other cases, the love object consumes the self to the self's detriment. Moreover, there's an inevitable tension between the self and our ego ideal. We're always trying to bridge the gap between them because the closer together they are, which is to say, the more I approximate the person I want to be, the happier I am. The further apart, the more miserable. If they are too far apart, it may result in psychosis, when we appear to be two different people. The tension between them can be beneficial or detrimental. When beneficial, the ego ideal prompts the self toward greater achievement, and is the source of ambition. If excessive, it may become the totality of one's existence, as with alcoholics, or a life devoted exclusively to a religion or political cause. This person will never be happy because they will always feel unworthy of love. At bottom, they hate themselves. Now for the crucial part of our discussion, what actually happens when we fall in love. When we fall in love, our ego ideal is projected onto the other person in the same way the child idealized the parent prior to the ego ideal's formation. This means that the lover regresses back to that period in childhood when his or her idealization of the parent was most intense. When the ego ideal is projected onto this person, the tension between the self and the ego ideal is eliminated, the same process that ensues in a manic state. When love is reciprocated, there is no finer experience. This is what it feels like to be madly in love with another person. Now we're at the mercy of that person, and our judgment is singularly compromised. It's as though the self is now loved by the ego ideal, though this part of the experience is unconscious. Only the blissful feeling achieves awareness, and this is about as happy as any human being can get, and the prototype for how we conceive happiness. Now we can begin to understand why it isn't so easy to distinguish between what it feels like to fall in love, and when we succumb to a manic state. In both cases, the ego and ego ideal merge, an experience of intense pleasure. Judgment is abandoned, and the sudden transformation serves as the beginning of a new relationship or initiation into a psychotic episode. Phenomenologically, it's virtually impossible to tell them apart. Anyone who falls in love and gives themselves to another person has lost his or her senses. There's nothing rational about this experience, which is also the most remarkable thing about falling in love. The respite it gives us from the obsessive worry and relentless strategizing that the anxieties of our day-to-day -day existence impose on us. Now that we have an idea of the complexity involved in falling in love, we can begin to appreciate that it isn't so easy to know whom we are falling in love with, nor even who I am. After all, don't we go into therapy in order to discover who we are? If we don't even know ourselves, how in the world can we presume to know others? If love compromises our judgment, it compromises our sanity as well. For sanity relies on judgment more than anything else. Love then is a kind of madness. But what kind of madness? Is it a good madness or bad or both? 
In order to answer that question, we need to look more closely what it means by what we mean by love and the different types of experience that we designate as love. <coughs> so far, we've only been talking about one kind of love, erotic or sexual love. What about those ways of loving that are not specifically erotic? In the English language, we have only one word for love, but the Greeks had several. I'm going to touch on only three. Erotic love, friendly love, which the Greeks call philia, and the most giving love possible, sympathic love, what the Greeks termed agape, but is more familiar in its Latinized form, caritas literally meaning charity. I want to focus primarily on the difference between eros and caritas, the two kinds of love that ensure genuine and lasting happiness. The Greeks saw eros as the most common love and the one most readily available. As we just saw, it is essentially narcissistic. Even when we love others erotically, we are in fact loving a projected image of ourselves, which is mixed up with early memories of our fathers and mothers and other people in our orbit. This might explain why it is the one form of love that Greeks associated with madness. However, erotically induced madness can either be a good, divinely sanctioned madness or the bad demonic variety. Our greatest blessing, says Socrates in the Phaedrus, comes to us by way of madness, provided the madness is given as a divine gift. Even before Socrates, Greek literature was replete with references to Eros's dark side, a daemon spirit who is capable of savagery, injustice, drunkenness, even madness. After all, one of Eros's principal features is his ability to possess and bewitch those mortals he would destroy, those who got on the wrong side of Aphrodite. As we know, that peculiar form of madness that serial killers fall prey to is always sexual in nature. They kill what they love, and they love to kill. And yet, Eros is also <coughs> capable of giving us joy and wonder. Whether it is the good, healthy kind of madness or its opposite, erotic love is nevertheless limited. This is due to its nature. Eros is hungry and insatiable, which is why it seeks proximity and wants to be with the love partner in all ways at all times. It is possessive. It is a love rooted in desire, so Eros wants the other, wants to both receive love and give love, and rejoice in the energy it unleashes. Unlike Caritas, Eros cannot know the other, because mystery is its principal vehicle, and the reason it causes us to lose judgment. If I were only capable of erotic love, my life would be profoundly constricted, and I would never find genuine happiness, no matter how many times I fall in love with however many people. Philia, or friendly love, is not erotically charged. It is epitomized by the friendships we enjoy, for whom we feel no sexual charge or urgency. In fact, friends, for the most part, offer us respite from the turmoil and uncertainty that occasion sexual relationships. This is why sex and therapy don't mix. If we haven't already, we learn from our therapist other ways of loving a person that are not so possessive and narcissistic, but more giving. This is what it also epitomizes friendship. Successful friendships thrive on reciprocity and don't do so well when one of the friends wants to hog all the attention. Yes, we all have our share of narcissistic friends, for narcissists are usually attractive 
And maybe to others, we are the narcissistic ones. But the friends we love the most are those who give as much as they take. This is why friendships, or philia, is an important step toward the most giving kind of love there is, caritas, or what I prefer to call sympathic love, rooted in an uncommon capacity for compassion. When psychotherapy is successful, it teaches us something about friendship, because our therapist becomes our best friend, the one person we can confide in without fear of being judged or condemned. This is a person we can trust will not use anything we tell them against us. In fact, this is what we value most in friendships, the sense of trust and fidelity they engender. The modern marriage is essentially an integration of erotic love and friendship. Marriages were originally rooted in legally binding, religiously sanctioned contracts that were obligatory. They were not rooted in romantic love the way they are today. Now we expect the relationship to serve